So, welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and with me today I have Sam Blanchard, a really dope indie cartoonist that I have discovered, along with many cartoonists I've discovered thanks to the Cartoonist K Facebook group. And I got your 24 hour comic that I ordered from you. It was dope. Um, and you got a new Kickstarter. Really excited for that, dude. Uh, but before we get into it, right before I hit that record button, you started telling me a little bit about yourself. I want the world, everybody listening, watching the third too. So um, welcome, dude. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Ryan. Um, really a uh, pleasure getting getting out there. No, I was just saying, I, um, I left the corporate world a year ago. Um, I was a mechanical engineer for a giant, you know, evil Swiss bank for 20 odd years. And it took the opportunity. It's like now I can do something I enjoy. I mean, I enjoyed engineering. That's that's um, you know fun. I got my education in that. But working in that environment just like you know wore me down. You know, commuting into New York and um, just all the corporate nonsense. Um, I dislike the Swiss intensely now. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, they're lovely people, lovely country, but working with them, it's really hard. So, you know, I took the opportunity to follow my two passions, and that is as a fencing coach and as an illustrator. You know, so my, yeah. my other job is, you know, teaching children how to resolve their problems with violence in the way we used to, because that's the best way. <laughs> But, you know, COVID has really thrown a, like, huge, like, uh, yeah. you know, wrench into all the works. Um, because 2020 was the year I was, like, going to go to cons and, like, meet some people and see some stuff and see, like, kind of, like, where the industry is and what's going on. Right. And so I, um, you know, I got my passes to ZapCon in March. Uh, my first con since Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out. And because last time I went to a comics convention, it was like 86, um, you know, because I'm stupidly old. And then, like, it was like the week after everything locked down. <laughs> oh, fuck, yeah. You know, the, the plan to, like, kind of get to know things and meet people and all that, especially, like, in the New Jersey region where I am, mm -hmm. was, was just really thrown into disarray. So the, uh, you know, I started, like, joining web groups like crazy. And I had been watching the cartoonist kayfabe on YouTube and found out they had a Facebook group or a subgroup associated with them on Facebook. I don't think it's an official, official group. Um, I'm pretty sure Ed and Jim blessed. I'm friends with Eli. Like, I know him. He shops at my shop. So I, I yeah. at the shop and I helped him edit the wizard, the first one, um, a little bit. And that's kind of what got me into cartoonist kayfabe was because... Yeah. I had heard and I had watched a couple of the wizard videos because like I grew up reading wizard. So yeah. um, that's, that's how I, I became like a familiar with it. But I, he told me that they asked permission if they could do it. So pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, official, um, official. For me, I don't believe Ed even belongs to the group. He doesn't. Well, Jim does. Jim does. I see Jim pop in every once in a while, but I don't, no. I don't think Ed does. I think Ed like, I get the impression he tries to like kind of stay offline a lot so he can focus on his thing. Yeah. I, I don't know him. I don't know anybody. I mean, that's kind of the vibe I get. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. so I just, I joined these groups and started meeting people and you know, that sort of thing. I've been putting stuff on Instagram for a couple of years now and got a little following there. Yeah. You're not making a lot of, you know, money off of Instagram. There are a lot of, you know, people are happy to look, but they're, they're not um, necessarily, you know, you know, separating money from their pockets to buy your stuff. Let's see. I guess the big thing was, it was kind of a, a really random thing. I was some, what kicked me off into the like real serious, um, I can do this uh, vibe was uh, some, somebody had seen one of my posts online and called me for a commission and so i did this uh tank girl commission for him and he really dug it and he shared it on a commission board and next thing i know i've got like a hundred commissions lined up <laughs> you know it just it just blew up like i was getting like you know 10 15 you know people you know reaching out i mean i think it was just like you know novelty a lot of you know, like here's this new guy you know he's he's not you know terrible and 
Um, at the time, I was still really, really cheap. You know, I've kind of bumped up my prices, so I the work level stays like where I wanted to be. I'm still way behind on my commissions uh, commissions list, but that actually convinced me I can do this. And where Matt King, uh, Matt King, who's doing uh, Tales to Enlighten with uh, James Edward Clark, who I had talked to a couple times on Instagram, I follow him and all that. He asked me to. Did he ask me? No, I just did a couple posters, pinups for the Tales to Enlighten thing because it's just gonzo crazy. And he asked me to do a eight page short for their second volume, which, you know, I picked up, I've got like four pages of it done and it's been vexing me since to get that finished. Um, but projects have just been rolling in uh, since then. You know, I did the 24 hour comic project which is, you know, it's kind of like our illustrator's equivalent of like running a marathon, right? You train for, you know, you do this big thing, is this huge push and you kill yourself. And then um, there's this huge relief. I did it afterwards. Um, it's really a lot like a marathon. And the comic red is what came out of that. I, I've got a disclaimer at the end because it wasn't strictly 24 hours. The initial push was about 30 hours. And part of that was because my daughter woke up at like eight in the morning while I was like going to run till noon. And, you know, she's 10 and she wanted breakfast and, you know, children want to be fed and watch cartoons and that sort of thing. And so I've had to break away from it and, you know, take care of her and get, get her food and, and set up in the morning. And then, you know, I came back and kind of lost the momentum, but overall it was about 30 hours of work for the initial push. And my plan from the very beginning was put it up on Kickstarter. And it was really, it was a trainer Kickstarter. Hmm. You know, I had like a logo is like, okay, well, I can print up some of these things and maybe I'll cover my printing cost. And, and I'm going to learn how Kickstarter works. I'm going to you know promote things and go through the whole process that I had no idea what it was. So this was my trainer Kickstarter project. It, it blew through its funding goal. And one of the things I, I said was like, if I, I was originally going to do like an ash can size, like a, a five and a half by eight, eight and a half uh, size. And then when I got to, uh, you know, like more than a thousand in, in funding, I, I decided I was going to do like an eight by 10. That required that I fix a bunch of the panels because the aspect ratio is all different. I couldn't just like zoom it out and have it fit, you know, these big weird gaps that I had to fix. So there was post work done. Um, to fix those and, you know, to get some stuff that just really looked like crap because I rushed through it and getting all the text looking right and things like that. So there was, there was more time put in it um, after that to fix things up and, you know, clean it up. I mean, people were paying for it. I, I would rather give them something nice than give them something that was strictly 24 hours, right? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I was so happy. Like, I didn't even see you post it. Like I said, like, like Eli posted that he had got it. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And I think I, I think I like tagged you in the comment and I was like, do you have any? I mean, I loved it. It's awesome. I, I think that like this past year, the pandemic, right? Like I really tried to focus. And I think a few months before, um, I really tried to focus on like discovering like new cartoonists that aren't in comic shops that I can't find uh, necessarily you know there are some shops that you can get like zines and stuff and self-published work like I don't I just don't have enough time in the day I have a daughter too and like she takes up a lot of my free time so I really liked your book and I was really stoked to see that uh the response of, from people it was cool like I kept seeing all everybody commenting on it and liking it and asking you if you had more I love the people are incredibly supportive I I'm overwhelmed by it all that's the cool thing and about the group Eli is fantastic. I mean, Eli is like the biggest cheerleader of everybody. He's, mm -hmm. he's amazing. I don't know how he possibly does all the things he does, but he is, um, he is a huge uh, booster for just the indie comic industry. Yeah, he's got, a, he's got a couple like super secret projects out there. I mean, you probably know about them. I know I about them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we can't tell everybody about them. So yeah. He so there's that. I'm in that. Um, that was another one of the things I got pulled into. Oh, um, cool, man. I didn't know. It was, uh, yeah, it was, that was another like weird thing. Um, one of the editors saw my work online, 
and you know you remember like how they were like on the super secret project there were all these like deadlines that everyone was like rushing to get so the editor said hey can you do that and he asked me to do coloring at first which was weird because yeah. i mean you're if you're familiar with my work and like what you see on Instagram, uh, I don't use a lot of color. Right. I mean, I, <laughs> I can, uh, but it's not my thing. I'm a black and white artist. And, um, you know, I've always been like an inks, inks guy. I love doing ink work. I have, you know, my whole illustrating career. A little touch of color here and there, I find like really, you know, helps it out and can cover up a lot of mistakes. You can you can make something that's otherwise kind of eh, look really good with a little bit of color because it's like, hey, look at this. That's not a mistake. And ignore <laughs> all these all the crappy part down here because the color is going to draw your eye away from all the stuff I did wrong. So he, he called me and was like, we've got this stuff. The guy you know can't get the coloring done. And can you color it? I, sure. Why not? So I colored that and you know they really liked it. They're happy. I did it fast. You know, and so they picked me up for a couple more stories in there on on the backside of that. So I did those. They look really cool. The The authors gave me some great stories to work with, you know, not for kids, uh, but really fun. Uh, yeah, I, as, I, I pre-ordered the minute uh, Rocco uh, posted that that thing in the group. Yeah, it's, um, so, yeah. you know, you'll see it out there under, under my pen name Schlepzig. I teach like a grade school, like comic book thing and I teach fencing to grade school kids and I use the pen name because I don't want someone like looking for my fencing stuff and like you know finding you know sexy ninja girls or whatever instead and think oh my god who is this pervert teaching my children <laughs> um, so I mean it's no secret that I am a schlepzig but it's uh it's also like just enough degree of se separation that it doesn't come up in like an immediate like casual google search Sam Blanchard fencing and it's like oh my god what am I looking at I used I used the pen name it was a handle I used online pre-web in um in the days of like VT100 emulators um that we ever did everything online in text your login names were um restricted to being eight characters long you know because there was only you know 16 bits of memory allocated to the registration and so that's that's how I ended up with Schlepzig, uh, which is a whole like uh, you know Thomas Pinchon reference back to Gravity's Rainbow, um, which was you know kind of my Ulysses uh, literary wise, just kind of reading that amazing novel, really hard to read. Pinchon is sometimes a task. I don't know if you're familiar with with no. Thomas Pinchon. He is, he is really fun, but okay. he's got this kind of stream of consciousness sense of writing that, you know, you'll, you'll be in a room and a guy walks into the room and then the plot follows the guy walking out of the room, which isn't the guy you were just talking about. And then he goes and talks to somebody else and the plot follows that person that he talked to. Oh, that and sounds kind of interesting. It goes round and round and it's a very nonlinear stream of consciousness sort of you know, way of writing, which I, I love. It's very challenging, but it can also be so challenging. It's hard to finish. Uh, I recommend Crying of Lot 49, which is a good trainer novel uh, for Pinch On. It gives you a taste okay. of his style, but it's not as hard to read as like uh, Gravity's Rainbow or Vinland or um, any of any of the other like big novels that have come out let's let's talk about comic books let's talk about how you what started your love for comic books and then in turn what or who maybe what artists inspired you to like want to uh do this like oh only kind of Ricky. i mean like like most kids of you know the 70s i read comics you know all the time i would you know, my mom would buy me like, you know, whatever was on the newsstand to shut me up when I was at the store or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so there are, you know, stack of like old Marvels and things like that, that have been read to death um, in, in the boxes here in my little crap old studio. You know, I, I just, I just love the words and pictures and the images just excited me. My parents are both artists. So, you know, visual, you know, the visual arts and everything is like, really kind of ingrained in our household so i gravitated on that 
and you know we always had they they taught art history um my my father taught art history in a high school and my mother had taught art history in high school and taught art itself in a couple schools but and so you know those early things like early dcs and early marvels which is kind of funny because that's those issues are the ones that are being mined today for all the mcu stuff yeah i know like i remember there's like this 1976 avengers annual that it's 76 78 avengers annual that is thanos collecting the the soul stones you know the infinity stones he's getting he's getting the soul stone he he, he kills adam warlock and uh after you know adam warlock eats gamera's soul into the soul stone and all that um and you know is like on his way to become like this titan and then like mcu happens and it's um it's like wow this is all like the stuff from my childhood and and it's all coming up but they're doing it wrong where's adam warlock um, yeah, it's like what they're doing with WandaVision and the West Coast Avengers stuff. You know, I was listening to, I've really been loving Rob Liefeld's podcast, Rob Observations. I think it's his passion and, and how it's just funny, like hearing uh, industry stories through the lens of him, you know? Yeah, and, um, I mean, I love awesome. listening to him. He's amazing. He's like Mr. Yeah. Energy. Uh, yeah, dude. I mean, it's so, his enthusiasm and his passion is just like, he exudes it and it gets you excited. So he was talking about early on, right, in the in the beginning of WandaVision, a lot of people, well, whatever, some people just couldn't get it and couldn't sit through it, right? Um, but he was talking about, like, old Avengers stories and West Coast Avengers stories. So I went back immediately and picked them up, kind of like the kayfabe effect, right? Like, cartoonist yeah. kayfabe, they'll talk about a book, and it shoots up on eBay. So usually I'll look at the title of a video they put up, and I'm like, oh, got to go buy it before people make this book, like, a $100 book. So I did it from Rob's podcast and all these issues have shot up. I did it just because I want to read them in their original format. I don't like the recolor yeah. um, that happens when they put it on like the really bright, you know, white paper. Cause it's not our newsprint. So much yeah, the, the is contract fine. is weird. Yeah. It just looks weird to me. So like, I don't care if it's, if the pages are a little yellowed, that's fine. I, it's just for me to read. It's for my enjoyment. Right. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. well, it's also the way the, I, you know, the way the colorist originally meant the eye to see it. Exactly. And, um, I've got a reprint of like long shot around here um, because I had picked it up in the newsstand. I got the reprint and it just like burns out my retinas. Yeah, I don't, I can't stand it. It's just, it's too bright to me. It's like, it's weird. Um, yeah. And the contrast is off. Yeah. Um, and that contrast is what really affects like your colorist choices. You know, if they had done the original coloring for, a bright white paper that would have used much more subdued colors than they did mm -hmm. the original separations. Uh, it is interesting to see that era um, that I didn't read, and I'm just reading now for the first time, being like mined, and nobody really yeah. realized. The MCU vision always irks me, and it it irks me uh, just the way they built him, because like, and when I was reading again, like one of those comics, my um, my mother you know bought to shut me up or i use my allowance to go get her something one of those comics from the 70s i've got has you know got the vision um who was made by hank pym he wasn't made by tony stark in in response to you know hank pym making ultron which is uh i drives me nuts but is wonder man you know coming in and you know back from the dead you know first time back from the dead and you know saying you know the vision stole his brain because the vision's initial like mind imprint was a uh, wonder man's brain right. after he died that's like one of my oldest comic book memories is just burned in my brain and then they like do it why is tony stark building it and basing it on his ai because that's not it it's this other guy um i'm i'm back to my you know where's adam warlock rage <laughs> yeah no i know and it sucks because like they have it's almost like they don't really have a choice that they have to like kind of rework stuff because like oh, yeah. him wasn't in the Avengers movie and it's like then he's old and and we got Scott Lang and it's it's like a whole thing people don't even probably know uh like that watch the movies they don't even know who Wonder Man is you know unless you're a comic book fan you don't you don't know um, yeah he he had a resurgence in my my years in the corporate world where I didn't really read comics so I've got this yeah. gap in my comics knowledge from like 1980 889 
uh, when I was grabbing indies from the comic book shop in Eugene, Oregon, when I went to University of Oregon, then until like a year and a half, two years ago, mm-hmm. I started looking at comics again. So, so this like whole, the whole image explosion, I was aware of it on the margins, you know, because, you know, once a geek, always a geek, you never lose your geek friends that talk about comic books every now <laughs> yeah. and again, but I wasn't like in it. So I missed that whole thing. Um, you know, which made the super secret project really interesting for me. It was, it was like this whole like thing, like everything exploded, the whole speculator boom. Yeah. Um, I kind of remember the beginnings of that because that was when I was going to the comic shop and I just saw like all these like weird things coming in, um, you know, the foil covers and the 3d covers and glow in the dark. And I was like, what, what are people doing? Um, do people read these things anymore? Uh, filling in, filling in the gaps of, you know, what happened. I picked up a bunch of trades and things like over mm-hmm. the years, like to fill in some of the gaps or just stuff that looked cool. Um, you know, I discovered like uh, Chris Bacallo, Bacallo. I don't know how you say his name. I know. I think I say Chris B- Bacallo. I, cause I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Unless I get a chance to ask him himself, I'm just going to have to go with what I think. So Bill Sienkiewicz, I said wrong for, I don't know how many years. Same. <laughs> but you know i discovered like some of his stuff in trades there's another guy that did a spider-man run that was really cool i picked those up um at like a barnes and noble you know shopping with with my kids um when they were you know teens i guess and needed to like buy naruto or something like that at the all fine stuff i follow artists more than i follow stories mm-hmm. again as an artist i'm always like kind of like who did this or this looks really cool what else do they do you know like uh since day one i was a huge uh Sienkiewicz fan you know from when he did like the dune adaptation um and he arrived in like new mutants um, oh yeah that stuff's them. great i was buying those you know like you know i'd spend my lunch money in high school to like go get those new mutants when they came out uh you know the whole demon bear saga mm-hmm. you know just blew my mind it's like i had no idea I comics could look like this you know again with my family you know being artists i i was thinking it's like here's this guy who's doing stuff like plimped and uh egan shealy and it's just amazing i'd been you know watching you know, guys like barry windsor smith uh who's got that very classic beautiful like illustration style like yeah. you know you would see like from maxfield parish or um uh, Rackham, who did like some of the original like uh, Grimm's Fale t- fairy tales in the mm-hmm. 20s. Uh, who's got that very classic illustration style uh, going back. It was a big influence on me developmentally. Um, and then like uh, Burn, I, I fell into incredible construction, like you know, especially like when he was doing Alpha Flight. Yeah. Um, loved Alpha Flight there in that, that first run. And I would, I would gravitate towards artists more. So are you familiar? I, I, are you familiar with Andrea Sorrentino? No, I'm not. I'm gonna write uh, that th- down. Yeah, I think you'd really dig him. Uh, he did a Green Arrow run with Jeff Lemire, and then he they just wrapped up. It's like this kind of like a mix of like horror with Dark Tower vibes, like the Stephen King novels They're called Giddy oh, cool. Girls, and it just ended. It's a 27 issue series um, from Image. I think you'd really dig his art. He's what they what he does with the art is it's. It's a mind fuck. I don't know how else to describe it. It's really cool. So I mean, it's there are so many incredible artists yeah. out there. Right now. I know. Um, it's, I mean, I love how experimental artists are getting now. Like they're really going. Like you can tell when, like, there's certain artists where you just see it off top and you know. And then I, I think those are the ones I gravitate towards. Like Daniel Warren Johnson's really dope too. I think. Yeah. One of my favorite artists right now. Yeah, I can't even keep track of all the really good guys out there. Yeah, there's um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess going back, going back to your original question, uh, which I really, I pulled you off topic again. I, okay. I meander, you know, again, in those early years, um, heavy metal started coming to America or heavy metal was being published in America, bringing like those European things. And those poisoned my mind early on. Uh, it was, you know, you, you like sneak around to the back of the store, like where they had like the adult stuff and you like, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, you know creep out when your you know mom's not looking and you can like you know check out the girly mags and i was checking out heavy metal you know one thing i i'm always going back to is like there were ranks of rocks poison my brain like really 
early on. Uh, mm-hmm. Liberatories, uh, ranks of rocks, and that is uh, that is just you know burned into my DNA now. Um, I you know I love those stories. As soon as I was old enough to be allowed to buy them, I you know found the heavy metal back issues that they were in, and I collected those. Um, I've collected them several times now. You know, this whole like crazy scene. Um, you know, I, I can't possibly imitate his uh, construction and draftsmanship. Liberatory uh, is an amazing, amazing artist. How he gets markers to do what he did, mm-hmm. I don't know. I can't get, get them to do anything close to that. <laughs> um, it just all looks like a mess by the time I try. Yeah, you know, that that poisoned my brain. And um Veach is Abraxas uh the Earthman. Um I remember that one. The the Kayfabe guys did like a, a quick Moby Dick um adaptation. I was disappointed they missed Abraxas, um, especially since they're such uh Rick Veach uh, fans. That's like the weird like sci-fi Moby Dick adaptation. Um I don't know if you're familiar with Abraxas. No, but I'm gonna look it up now. It is, it is crazy. I think Veach has got it on Amazon as like a comicsology. There, there are print versions available. They're pretty expensive, more than I necessarily want to uh, pay pay for like a single book to look at. Uh, but I'll, I'll definitely got the comicsology ones there. But it is, it is, it's Veach. So it's yeah. beautiful and it is weird and insane and violent and gory and sexy and you know all those things you don't want your 10 year old children to see yeah those those were big influence on influences on me as i started to like understand more about the wider world of comics and and narrative storytelling well now that you're now that you, you know you your 24-hour comic was successful you're saying like all the, your commission stuff all this stuff is like ramping up right now you have a new kickstarter uh that's currently running could you share a little bit about that and like yeah, I mean, um, it's Why Did the Chicken Cross the Road? Mm-hmm. Um, which, I mean, it, it, the title is is kind of crazy. And it, it it initially came from a couple things. One, um, uh, Matt Sardo from Monkeys Fighting Robots. Mm-hmm. Uh, their magazine, I've got an interview with them coming up, like, shortly, too. But he reached out to me to do a short for the winter issue uh, that just came out. So I was I was just kind of racking my brain, and then why did the chicken cross the road is one of the prompts I used in my kids' um, comic book class, right? Because it's it gives a like really strong like narrative push. You've got a setting, you've got an idea, you've got kind of a resolution, and you're just filling in like a couple gaps in the plot. Why did the chicken cross the road? Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe there's aliens on his side of the road. Maybe there's you know. A uh, taco stand on the other side of the road. I mean, what what is there? Why did he do that? So, I mean, and they're always like him and Ha, like how boring it is, and they want to, you know, draw guys exploding or you know, um, you know, girls in love or whatever you know is going on. The kids are incredibly creative. But so, why did the chicken cross her? And it turned into like this concept. Um, there's chicken who's you know this kind of burned out you know noir. You know, it's very noir type story with chicken and he's got to go solve um, this this problem of a possessed microwave. And, you know, he's he's brought in by his buddy, Ronaldo the Magnificent, who is a luchador tech support guy. I was just trying to be like as big and crazy as I possibly could. Um, I like these stories that, you know, just really kind of burst out of the boundaries of what they could be so you know it's this big action mystery thing of a uh, chicken uh killing these guys uh, you know going after this possessed microwave and uh dark technology wizards that are similar but legally distinct from alan moore so i did a uh a f- so i scripted out like a five page thing and you know, as the ideas started pulling in, it turned into a six-page thing and then an eight-page thing. And it's like, I can't turn the turn monkeys fighting robots into, you know, the chicken magazine. Right. Um, I knew Matt wasn't going to give me that much uh, that much room in it. So I pared it down to an intro, a uh, five-page kind of like tight-ish uh, intro thing. Just kind of developed the ideas on, put on the back burner 
for uh, my next, you know, big 24, 30 page uh, project. And so okay. chicken is developed. We've, you know, I've got one of, this is, uh, Barb, I can send you the, the, the image. Yeah, uh, please. This is, the, this is the shirt that I made uh, based on the chicken X poster I did. Uh, obviously, homage to the Weapon X Barry Windsor Smith poster, mm -hmm. um, the cover of the of the um, the one thing, and you know he's fighting like these guys, you know the big glass eyeball heads. You know that's kind of the nature of the thing. So you okay. know, chicken. I kind of figured he's got like this sort of like Constantine sort of like you know tired guy wants to get out. The business keeps pulling him back in. The overall plot device is it's a world that ours could become AIs are becoming smaller and tighter and we're finding more and more intelligent devices. Like, you know, our phones are meant to like kind of figure out what we want and, you know, same thing. We've got them all over the place and they're just getting smarter and smarter. They become really smart and they become ubiquitous. I uh, like on the, on the intro, you know, he's talking about how his toaster has a, um, you know, has a degree from uh, Harvard, I think. <laughs> you know, but it has to continue working as a toaster because nobody cares about his literature degree. You know, there's, there's this idea that everything, like everything you own is smart. It's essentially, you know, sentient, you know, that's cool. Your that's an awesome is, idea. It's sentient, your refrigerator is sentient and you've kind of got them working for you in your house, sort of a slavery thing. I've got this like kind of subtext of artificial intelligence rights going on. In this, this, you know, this microwave goes nuts and he's got to go, you know, go find it. I mean, his, his friend, Ronaldo, you know, chicken has gotten out of the tech support business. Ronaldo is still a tech support commando and needs him to come in, help him with this job that he can't handle because chicken's the best he is at what he does. Right. As kind of evolved from there. I'm, you know, I got the five pager banged out. I'm still like putting the finishing touches on, you know, a bunch of pages to build this out to the 30, uh, 30 pages. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was really developing the, uh, the microwave character. It comes and I'm just trying to hit like all these beats. I'm going to, you know, if you, if you read the five pager in monkeys fighting robots or read, I've got the five page sample on my Kickstarter, a link to it. Okay. So you can read that. Um, which is why did the chicken cross the road on Kickstarter by Schlepzig? Um, if you sure search for Schlep Schlepzig, S H L E P Z I G, uh, Jim Rugg misspelled me on uh, in his process zine. So, and you know what? I sometimes people call uh, refer to it as comics lounge with an S, and I want to correct, but then I'm just like, is it really? Is it really worth? And the problem is, is there another channel started like a month after me on YouTube, the Comics Lounge, and I'm yeah. like, fucker. So like, how many how many subscribers do I lose because of this one letter that yeah. that makes a difference? You know, uh, I try not to correct though because I'm like, it's is it, it's not worth my. If I'm getting praise, I'm just like, you know, whatever. Like they can yeah. well I have a logo, so you can just find the couch with the, the couch with a cape. You know what I mean? And you know it's me. So yeah, luckily the Schlepzig is a far less common word than yeah. I'm glad you got you told me what was the story behind that because I it was gonna be one of the things I asked you. So that is that you will if you Google Schlepzig, you can find anything, uh you can find stuff going back a long ways. Um, if you really dig. Okay. I think there's some like bad fiction I wrote in college that you can still find in places. Before we um get out of here. I do want to know if you could share some of the tiers that we have or that you have for the Kickstarter and how has the response been so far? Has, has this like, ex has this been more successful earlier on than uh, the last one you did? It, I think early on, it got a little bit more traction than the first one mm -hmm. because you know, people, people have known it, people have seen it. As soon as I launched it, like Eli was there and, uh, Chris Jerome, a author I've worked with from uh, Albany, Oregon, in his Discordia magazines, uh, his Discordia comics. So there's like this initial push, and then I've been publicizing it kind of briefly uh, since then. Um, unfortunately, it's been fencing season with the high school, which is mm -hmm. tying up a lot of my time. So I haven't had 
all the hours to like d- devote to a uh, promotion that I would like. Okay. And I'm, I'm really a better artist than I am a businessman. I'd rather draw than promote stuff, which is, yeah. you know, which is in itself like a full-time job. Um, you know, 10% of the job is actually doing art. Uh, 90% of the job is just hustling, getting people interested and, and excited about the art. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which I'm not good at. <laughs> I mean, I love it. I'm excited about it, but I'm just not good at promotion. So I really appreciate you bringing me on, Ryan. This oh, of is, course, man. I love your art. And, and I want, I want, if I can, if even like one person discovers, discovers your stuff that didn't know it before, I, I would feel somewhat successful in that because like not everybody's a part of the group. And I wouldn't have discovered you if it wasn't for that Facebook group. And I just want to share your art. I want to make sure people help back this Kickstarter, get to see, get some eyes on your stuff, man, because you are a really dope artist. You know, the Kickstarter is going well. We're a little over half funded now. And um, I think it's it's going on. I've got more time now, so I'm going to start doing more promotions. I just put a really bad video up at the recommendation of one of my friends online another author that i've been doing comics with um uh mark darden he said you gotta have a video so i whipped together a video i don't do video um Mm -hmm. hopefully it hopefully it will help he said anything's better than nothing and i think i really fell into that category of anything may or may not (laughs) be nothing um you know but it's out there it's growing i'm going to be promoting it more um i'm trying not to do the um the the big ticket commission levels this time okay um i may have to um to hit my goal but i got so many of them last time it just it was really hard to get them all done uh in time that i had to deliver with my uh with my deadline you know and i needed to get it all done one of the things i learned about kickstarter is you're gonna only have one kickstarter going at a time so you have to be fully delivered on your first kickstarter to start another kickstarter so I needed to have, you know, like 15 commissions done really fast so I can launch Chicken in time for when the winter issue of Monkeys Fighting Robots came out. Because I didn't want to have that come out, have people go look for it and find nothing. <laughs> right. So I had to had to get it all finished and this whole huge stack of commissions got through them. They're beautiful. Some of my best work. Um, if you go to my Instagram, you can see all the almost all of those commissions are posted. I've got a big Micronauts commission that I'm waiting because he also commissioned a bunch of other things that you know I'm going to send to him one big package. So I'm keeping it all the secret until till that's done. But okay, cool. Uh, there's that. And, you know, same thing with chicken. I want to be able to get chicken done, get it out, and then get on to the next thing. I've got a couple more projects. I may not go the Kickstarter route for my next projects. Um, you know, I may I may take some of the money from chicken and just you know, use that to. Um, do a print run of the next project, which I want to do a uh, fencing project. Okay. All of this has been like kind of training to do the fencing comic that's a, that I've wanted to do for years. You know, the, the project is uh, touche. And again, if you, if you check my Instagram, I've got a bunch of touche drawings, um, you know, fencing illustrations that I've done, uh, fencing of famous fencers, um, portraits of the world cup guys uh that are out there um i just did one for marcus mepstead uh uk fencer uh, which is what i've got as stickers right right now i've got some other ones of us like epa fencers and some other great fencers um out there but i want to do a uh, fencing comic based on my experiences as a high school fencing coach (laughs) Uh, kind of you know, drawing from that, the stories and the kids and the drama and the excitement and, you know, it's a, it's a topic I'm passionate about. I love fencing and, you know, I think the stories are there. I think it'd be a really compelling comic. There's, there's one other fencing comic out there, but it is not focused on the fencing as much as it is on the young male fencers and their lack of shirts. I think I know which one you're talking about. You know, it's out there. It's it's reasonably well drawn, but I don't think the person that did it has ever fenced at all because there are so many like crazy errors in there. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's one of my next projects out there. Um, 
Awesome. So want to, but you know, I don't want to give up chicken. I don't want to give up the uh, file twenty two thirty one uh, girls from Red. Um, I've got a um, uh, limited, like a uh, like a graphic novel level story ready for them um, at Area fifty one. Um, and you know, again, like just crazy nuns and go go boots blasting up aliens. Um, yeah, dude. Um, and I'm, crazy, I'm down for all of it, man. That's awesome. Uh, the, those crazy paranormal paranormal investigators. Um, I don't remember how much I told you about you know kind of that like world in um in the red intro. I've got like a ash can, um, like a little eight and a half by eleven zine size that I did, which is a uh, uh, the tales of boars and or the uh, the story of boars and bees um, that I just printed up a bunch of. Um, again, here's the little ash oh. cover. Oh, cool, man! Uh, and yeah, it's uh, it was the first thing I did when I was learning how to like kind of do narrative storytelling and setting things up. So it's it's rough. I kind of want to redraw all of it looking at it now. Um, it's rough. It's it's cool. Um, it is on my Instagram if you dig in there. Uh, all eight. No, it's twelve pages. It's a twelve pager, and it's fun. It's fun. There are uh, robots and ninja boar people and kung fu nuns and ray guns and explosions and fucking bees uh which is like one of the big money lines of the whole thing um uh, you can see it on my instagram i can send you a link yeah. to the pdf you can just dig into that yeah i'm down man for sure i'm down to check i i can't wait to see you know like all these projects that you got cooking up the the chicken one i'm definitely down i'm excited i i hope it gets back i'm pretty sure it will you'll get a lot of support uh, definitely from the group. It, it's, I mean, you're in the middle of the, of the Kickstarter right now, which they always say is like the lull, right? I think, but yeah, I, I, anybody listening or watching, uh, I definitely think you guys should all go back to this project. And I just wanted to, um, before we got out of here for you to share where we can all find you online. And I'm going to drop all these links, including the link to the Kickstarter down below in the comments. Okay, uh, cool. Well, um, I'm on Facebook and, sh and Instagram as schlepzig.comics and uh, schlepzig.nsfw, uh, which is where, you know, I'll do like figure drawings and things like that, which are nudes, so not safe for work. Um, you know, race your stuff goes there. Um, and I just want people to like have a place where they can see comic stuff and see other stuff. Um, I've got a Patreon where you can see um, early stuff, putting up pages, putting up like high res scans of all the art I'm doing. So like everything that's condensed on Facebook and Instagram when it comes out. Um, if you're on my my Patreon for a buck a month, you can get high res versions of all that stuff. At a couple more dollars a month, you get to see the pages that I'm doing, and you have access to all my PDFs and things like that um, at five a month. And if you really love me, you can get like on the on the uh, physical subscription to uh, send send you a care package uh, once a month. Um, you know, whatever stickers, prints I'm putting up on my Etsy shop, uh, which is Schlepzig Illustration on Etsy. And I think that is my meager commercial offerings. I've got a couple others out there, but they're largely abandoned on like Ko-Fi and Webtoons and all those all those other things. But projects, um, just so many projects. Um, I'm doing um, the March of Robots prompts just as like a warm up in the day. So I've got a, a like two, three hour page of uh, robot story that's coming up with that. And that's just a freebie. Uh, but I'm gonna package it up into like, a, like an ash can. When we have cons again, these are gonna be things you can get at you know, my table for you know, a couple bucks. If cons ever happen again, um, hopefully, I'll get, hopefully I'll get out to the West Coast at some point, though I'd be up north. Uh, my family's all in Portland, so. I'm I mean, I, lo I love Oregon, so I'll, I'll, I'll hit you up if you, if you go out to Oregon for sure. I'm, I'm hoping to do, um, you know, I've got my application in for Rose City. Uh, haven't heard anything back on that yet. I may go into Oricon 
uh, which is a sci-fi convention. Uh, but I've got friends on the board for that, so I can probably get into that. You know, it, it's so invigorating. I'm so thrilled to be doing something I really love now mm -hmm. that um, doesn't, uh, you know, compromise my integrity uh, the way working for a bank did. You know, I mean, and I mean, I was in facilities. I wasn't involved in any of the like evil stuff, but you know, it all rubs off. You you know, you're associated with a kind of toxic organization, and it it just poisons your poisons your whole life. So, I am so happy to be in this business now, breaking in, getting known, meeting all you amazing people. Yeah. Um. I mean, you know, again, with you and and Eli and the whole kayfabe group and all the other people that I've met. I mean, they're these creators from all over that I'm meeting that, you know, outside of kayfabe and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like coming home. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's fantastic just for my life to have gotten to a point where I have an opportunity to take this, even though the plague has thrown a curveball in it. It's, it's been positive in that I probably wouldn't have met you guys like in the West coast. I probably wouldn't have been as involved in the kayfabe group if, um, if COVID hadn't happened, so. Well, um, I mean, I'm glad you have been. And um, I love your work. Like I said, at the beginning of the episode, during the episode, um, everybody that's that's listening and watching, I will drop all links for you down below. So you can back the Kickstarter, check out um, Sam's art. And thank you again for taking time to chat with me, dude. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I, can't, I can't wait to, you know, next time you got a project, dude, let's do this again. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll let you know when the next things come up. But yeah, watch watch the Instagram. There's always stuff going up on there.